I am with Northwest Neighbors Village, and I, along with my colleagues from Cleveland and Willie Park Village and Palisades Village, are delighted to have partnered with Sibley Memorial Hospital and bring you this informational series. For those of you who are from not familiar with Villages, Villages are neighborhood nonprofit organizations that provide opportunities for older adults to be engaged in their community. With the assistance of a small professional team, our dedicated core of screened and trained volunteers help to reduce social isolation among older neighbors while also assisting with practical tasks. Our three villages offer a robust calendar of events that include fitness classes, author talks, discussion groups, virtual happy hours, among other things. For those who need some support, we deliver groceries and medication, assist with technology, provide rides to medical appointments, and more. If you're not part of your local village, now's the time to get involved. You can visit Northwest Neighbors Village's website at www.nmvdc.org, Cleveland and Woodley Park Village's website at www.clevelandwoodleyparkvillage.org, or Palisades Village at www. PalisadesVillage.org. We hope to hear from you soon, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, so much, Stephanie. We're so happy to have you here. Let me just give you some of the rules of the road for today. As I mentioned earlier, for those of who were already here, we're going to be uh, taking questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you'll click on the Q&A, you can type in your questions as they come up for you. Um, feel free to, to do that at any time. We'll answer as many of the questions as we can during the presentation um, because many of your questions will already be taken care of with that. But keep entering them and then those that, that we have not covered, we will be happy to do in the Q&A portion following each of the speaker's talks. I'll first like to, to uh, welcome our two speakers today, uh, Myra Zeisel from Sibley in Infection Prevention, and Dr. Sarah Tarakani, um, who, Tarakani, who is an infection, uh, dis infectious disease specialist at Sibley. We're so pleased to have both of them with us today. We'll start with Myra Seisel. And Myra, um, you uh, were so pleased to have you with us today. I've known Myra for a while and I'm so Please, she was able to join us. She has her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from University of Virginia and also her Master of Public Health in of both public health and epidemiology from Yale. And she's been at Sibley for about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. She recently spoke for us at the Sibley Senior Association. We're so glad to have her back. Go ahead, Myra. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Marnie, and everyone. Um, so I'm going to mostly cover COVID today. I uh, might touch on some other things, but I first wanted to start with a few pictures that I thought were um, interesting. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So pro tip, you should always wash your hands even when there isn't a global virus panic. Something to keep in mind. So you're going to see some themes here that I'm going to talk about throughout my presentation. Next slide. So if you have a better way to uh, help me keep my hands off my face until this pandemic, pandemic ends, I'm all ears. I'm a serial face toucher, so I have to listen to this one. Next slide, please. Mask wearing. Next slide, please. And then social distancing, or for people who live in Florida, perhaps keeping one alligator distance from everyone else. So we'll touch upon this theme multiple times as we talk about um, first the chain of infection. I'll touch on flu very briefly, and then we'll talk about um, what to do when you're out and about in the community, how to stay engaged with uh, your friends, family, and members of the community so that we do prevent social, social isolation. So first, just basics of um, infection, you have um, germs. So bacteria, viruses is what we're talking about today. You have a reservoir, the germs come out um, of the, the person with potential virus or bacteria. There's a transfer of those germs. And then it, a vector, which in this case would be the hands, 
um, to go into the nose, eyes, mouth. And so this cycle, in order to prevent infection, you need to break this chain. And there are a number of ways you can do it if you go to the next slide, please. So first, um, as I mentioned, um, hand hygiene. We're going to talk about that a lot. Um, social distancing, not touching your face. So the mask is there for a number of reasons, but sometimes for people who don't want to touch their face a lot, that's helpful to have a mask on. Um, cleaning high-touch surfaces. I'll get, talk a little bit about more about that later. And then staying well. So um, taking care of yourself, sleeping well, eating well. Um, having those social interactions as part of staying well, but also getting vaccinated. So we're going to talk about the next slide, flu vaccine. So now we're here to talk about COVID, but flu vaccine, uh, start of flu season, what, now is the time to get vaccinated. You want to start, um, you want to get flu shot before it starts spreading in your community, because it does take about two weeks to build immunity. Um, and the CDC currently recommends everyone getting their flu shot by the end of October. Just a reminder, if you're 65 years and older, you should not get the nasal spray. Um, the regular flu shots are approved for people in 65 and older, but there are also two special shots, uh, flu vaccines, the flu zone high dose, which contains four times the amount of antigen um, as a regular, and it's associated with stronger immune response uh, with, through greater antibody production. And then the flu ad agitated flu vaccine it has an additive that can create a stronger immune response. So I'm just putting my plug in there. Um, I'm sure Sarah will talk about that some more as well. Or sorry, Dr. Tarakani. Next slide, please. So, and this seems very basic, but it's the most important thing you can do um, to protect yourself is to keep your hands clean. Um, soap and water is excellent. If you don't have access to that, alcohol-based um, hand rub is excellent. I always have some on me. I have some in my car. I have some at my entrance of my home. So just making sure, first of all, that you have it available. I know it's been a little trickier to get, um, but I think there's more options out there now than at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so after wearing gloves, um, I do still see people out and about wearing gloves. I, I personally don't recommend it. I think sometimes it gives a false sense of security um, because you might get your gloves contaminated and then touch your face or touch objects that are high touch in your um, area, in your home, in your car. So you can choose to wear them, but making sure that you're conscious of when you take them off, doing good hand hygiene, and then when you're wearing them, you're not touching things to, um, to spread. So obviously, after using the restroom, before you eat, that's very, very important because, of, again, if you're putting your hands to your mouth, touching your food, and then ingesting it, it's important. After you eat, so you don't spread it to others. And then um, first thing you do, this is always what I do, and I do it with my son, wash your hands when you come home. Uh, first thing I do when we walk, walk in. That's good. That's good practice, no matter uh, what's going on in the world. <laughs> Next slide, please. So seven step to hand, hand washing seems basic, but it's really important because through all the studies that are done um, in infection prevention related to hand hygiene, we do see some patterns in areas that are missed. Um, so usually the palms are done well. The backs of the hands, the fingernails can be areas where things aren't clean well in the back of the thumb. So making sure that you're really taking the time to rub the soap in well um, and not skipping any steps. People, there are different songs you can sing to wash your hands for 20 seconds. So it's the time, it's uh, making sure you have the right products, the soap and water, um, and making sure you have a proper technique, which is displayed here. So getting your thumb, the backs of your hands, um, and all of those, those areas that seem to get missed. Next slide, please. I've mentioned this before, alcohol-based sanitizer. Again, you're going to want to use the same technique, so make sure that you have enough product to evenly cover all of the surfaces of your hands, making sure you really take the time to rub your hands together um, for at least 20 seconds. So you really need that time to uh, inactivate virus bacteria in your skin. All right, just want to hammer this home again. Uh, wearing gloves is not a substitute for cleaning your hands. Um, again, you're still going to have to clean your hands even if you wear gloves and you can contaminate 
your environment or touch your face with contaminated gloves if you wear them and don't do good hand hygiene. So high touch surfaces, um, this is, there's been a lot of conversation about this throughout COVID. Um, what is considered, how long does COVID last on surfaces? What is the risk to me? At this point, I don't believe there's any known um, case of COVID that's been passed through the surface, but we do know that it can live on surfaces. So we always want to make sure, even for, for flu, for other bacteria that be out there, making sure you clean things that you touch frequently. So cell phones, landlines, uh, the toilet seat and the flush, sinks in the kitchens and the bathrooms. Um, if you're washing your hands, there's going to be bacteria, viruses on it, light switches, TV remotes, and doorknobs. Um, I think this is very important. Again, you can kind of grab these things when their hands are dirty. So you want to make sure that you're coming back around and cleaning it. If you can do it once a day, just those items, uh, that would be great. I can't say I'm 100% perfect with that, but I try. Myra, there's, um, it's come to my attention that there may be some interference. So if you might slow down your uh, talk a little, your speech a little bit. Um, sure. It's hard with interference, apparently, to hear. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. No Thank problem. You. Appreciate it. Next slide, please. So, talking about COVID specifically, I think there's a lot of, um, we're going to talk about this, there's just a lot of questions related to activities. What's safe, what's not. Um, I like this the graph from CDC, I thought it was just really a visual person. I think it's very helpful. So things that increase your risk are crowded places, indoor spaces, and no masks. And when you put those all together, that's when you create a risk that's the highest for yourself. Um, obviously, opposite um, decreases your risk. So wearing a mask, both you and anyone else that you're with, having six feet of space between anyone else, and being outside. And we're going to go into further detail kind of how this could work um, in your community, in your home, to make this a safe way to socialize with other people. So wearing a cloth mask, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it's one of the basics, but it is very important. Um, CDC recommends wearing it in areas where you can't control what other people are doing. Um, going to the pharmacy, pick up your medication, go in the grocery store, always wear your mask. Some places mandate it, but I think it's good practice just to wear it. Um, and also when the community-based transmission is very high, that's just, you don't want to take any risk with not wearing it. And why is this important? So as we've learned with COVID, there are people who don't show any symptoms, um, but they can transmit the virus. So they might be completely asymptomatic or it's in that time period before they've been exposed, they have it in their system, but they don't have any symptoms. Um, and when you're in close proximity, just speaking, singing, sneezing, coughing, that can spray the virus into the environment and you don't want to. You want to prevent that by wearing a mask. I've seen a lot of people wearing all different kinds of masks, um, and that's fine. I think I have preferred the cloth mask. I want to leave the medical mask to the medical people because we do have a concern for there not being enough, um, as it, especially as we anticipate future COVID um, to be increased. So I wear mine. I wash it in the washing machine, and then I air dry it, um, try to rotate. I have enough on hand. And I've tried different. I don't know if people have opinions about this. I've tried different kinds. I have ones that go behind my ears, one that go behind my head. Um, ones with nose clips, I wear glasses sometimes, so making sure I have something that doesn't fog my glasses. Um, just finding what's comfortable for me, uh, especially in the temperature. If it's really hot outside, some running mask might be more comfortable than another. So just finding something that works for you, I think, is really important. Also, you want to understand the risks of going out. Everyone has different risk profiles, um, so you want to understand what that means for you, and it's different. It's difficult for CDC to tell every single person what their risk might be. However, things you want to take into account. So what is the widespread um, incidence of COVID in your community? Is it fairly low? Is it 
at an all-time high. Um, you know, with flu season, things are going to be confused as far as initially people are going to have respiratory symptoms. It might be hard to tell whether it's flu or COVID or another uh, virus. It's something to keep in mind. Um, are you going to have any contact with somebody that's sick or not wearing a mask or people that don't want to wear a mask or refuse to? Um, or you can be involved in touch with someone who might be asymptomatic. You know, kids are back in school. Some are meeting in person, some are not. Um, what's that risk for you as a grandparent or parent? Some people going to work uh, during this time. Again, are you at an increased risk of severe illness if you do get COVID? Um, do you take everyday actions to protect, protect yourself? So are you keeping your distance? Are you performing good hand hygiene when um, you're at home or when you go out? Are you cleaning high touch surfaces? And what are you doing to mitigate those risks? And then the amount of time. Are you, um, you know, there's a difference between going for a walk in your neighborhood and walking down the street and somebody, you see someone else on the street passing you. I consider that extremely low risk, so it doesn't hurt to wear a mask. However, if you are going into a pharmacy because you need your medication and there are going to be other people in there and there's a long line, you know, that's a little bit riskier. Maybe you plan ahead and find out when it's a little less busy. Um, so just being thoughtful about that can impact your risk. Next slide, please. Yeah. So running essential errands, uh, life goes on. And we've been, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, we all thought this would blow over quickly and it's, it's here to stay for a while. So just things to think about as you do your normal activities outside of your home. Stay home if you're sick. It doesn't matter if it's, you don't know what it is, just try to stay home. Um, use online services when available. I think Stephanie Chong, you mentioned that there are so many resources within the villages to help um, you know, help someone get asked for help if you need ordering your, your groceries online. There's a learning curve with that. Um, and then wearing masks in public settings, as I talked about, especially when you're not around people in your household. Um, social distancing, hand sanitizer, obviously washing your hands. So again, the basics, I'm going to say that probably come back to you over and over. Hand hygiene, wearing a mask, staying your distance as much as possible. So people want to get together, um, and I think it's it's really important to interact with other people in this scenario. And I I hear of all extremes. So there's people who don't want to leave the house because there's there's a lot of fear there, and there's high risk. And then there's people doing things that um, seem extremely risky. And then obviously there's a lot of middle ground there. But some things to think about. So if you choose to have a gathering. There are things you can do. Again, remind guests if they're sick that they should stay home. Don't host something if you're sick. Um, if people know that they've been exposed to COVID in the past two weeks or they're showing COVID symptoms, they should stay home. If they have someone in close contact to with COVID, they should also stay home. And then just putting that bug in their ear that people, that they have high risk people at home, that they should consider that as well if they're going out and about, and it's not just about your impact for yourself. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about hosting gatherings, cookouts, that should be what people are doing a lot these days that feels comfortable, I think, for a lot. So food and drink, when you're serving food and handling food, if you want to limit the number of people touching the utensils with food, that's gonna help you the most. Um, I see people bringing their own food. You know, everyone gets takeout or make something at home and gets together in a backyard and does it that way. Um, I know that's not gonna work for everyone. If, if food is being prepared inside, make sure you limit who's doing that. Um, consider one person to serve the food. So again, most people aren't touching the serving utensils and then using single use options can be really helpful. So I'll address any condiments, et cetera. Next slide, please. This one's a little busy, so I apologize. But again, going back to the basics that I mentioned at the beginning. So social distancing. So trying to be outside. Um, I think things are going to shift as the winter is winter is upon us soon. Uh, it's getting colder already. So if outdoors isn't feasible. Try indoors, but make sure you have good ventilation. Crack some windows. Put a ceiling fan on. Um, and then arrange your space, whether it's indoors and outdoors, with tables and chairs separate. 
for either by household, if you two households separate those or put, just strategize about it. Be smart, um, thinking ahead. When guests arrive, don't hug them. I know it's hard. You, everyone craves touch at this time. It's been a long time for some people, but try to wave, uh, give a verbal greeting instead. So mask wearing, again, either ask people that bring stuff to wear their own, or you can also provide them. Um, that might help people be more comfortable if they, they can bring them themselves. And then hand hygiene, I would uh, have things out, have some bottles of hand sanitizer out. Again, doing 20 seconds when you get there, uh, when you leave, before you eat, after you eat. Um, I think the challenge that comes with outdoor gatherings is the bathroom. That comes up a lot. What do I do with the bathroom? Um, I think you did the best you can. Um, you've obviously, it's, it's great if people don't have to use the bathroom, but I don't think that's realistic. If you can crack a window in the bathroom, that's great, or put the fan on and make sure there's enough soap in there. People aren't waiting in line for the bathroom inside um, and try to use single use items, whether it's paper or something you can wash. And then uh, I touched a little bit about this, but again, the com commonly touched surfaces or shared items, so that goes for the waste that comes from hosting a gathering, so trash cans, try to just keep the lid off for touch lists. Um, if you're handling all the, the garbage bags, make sure you, you can wear gloves, just make sure you do good hand hygiene after you take those gloves off, and then make sure you disinfect after you use those um, shared items, and then the areas that you use for placing the food or the chairs, just you can clean those after and then wash any linen well. All right, dining out. Um, there are different places that are doing different things. I, I think there's a lot of questions about it. Um, and I, I, I urge you just to, if you're interested in doing this or um, you're looking into it, just you can always call the restaurant and ask. Um, I've done that for doctor's appointments and dentists to see what people are doing. Just, I think being thoughtful about it is very helpful um, for the restaurants to do. I think they want the business, so they're trying to be accommodating. Let's we'll check their website or call. Um, when possible, sit outside at least six feet apart. Um, I am seeing tables closer together in some areas, so just being mindful. Maybe, maybe you drive by the place first and see what it looks like from the outside. Again, wearing masks when you're sitting less than six feet apart, um, especially when you're indoors or when you're with different household um, members or people outside of your household. Take precautions as much as possible. It's difficult when you're eating and drinking, but when you're not, maybe you can wear your mask. Um, if you're in the entryway, you're going inside, waiting area, make sure you wear your mask. So anywhere inside, whether it's the bathroom, the hallway. Um, when you Bring your hand sanitizer, clean your hands well before you get there, and again, when you leave. And if possible, um, choose foods that are not self-served um, so that you're not touching the same stuff as if someone brings it out. And if you're going to use a restroom, making sure that they have soap 101. I thought this was an interesting picture. This was taken in Germany. Um, again, I was saying restaurants want to be uh, want want the business and want people to feel comfortable, so they they put a whole bunch of pool noodles on people's hats, and that's how they know that they're keeping their distance outside. <laughs> Gyms. This is another hot area of debate. Um, so prepare before you go. This is something that you're choosing to do. Uh, try to prepare as much as possible. Again, call them, look at their website, understand what they're doing. Um, and then if you are choosing to go and you can sign up for a time, a lot of places are doing reservations instead, then do that as much online as possible. Um, but also when you get there, look to see what they're doing. Are they using plexiglass to protect their own staff? Are the staff wearing masks? Are they keeping locker rooms open or closed? Um, they should need to have the bathrooms open, but areas where more people can congregate um, should be closed. Uh, limit activity indoors. So group activities, um, big, you know, big exercise classes. You can do those outdoors or online. Um, then I would I would do that. If it is inside, making sure 
the attendance is limited and that there's space between you all, um, at least six feet if possible. Some places mandate masks while you're exercising. Um, there's some debate on that. If you're working out inside a gym and you're using shared equipment, make sure it's clean and disinfected, um, whatever their process is. I think usually gyms anyway have disinfection wipes that you're supposed to use between um, exercise equipment. People don't always use them, but uh, hopefully they're doing more so now. Wear a mask. Um, definitely when you're going in and out, if you can wear it while you're exercising, great. Depends on the level of uh, activity that you're doing. And people have friends at the gym. If you see your community members or your gym friends, just give them a wave, hello. Uh, try not to touch. Next slide, please. All right. So what happens if you do get sick? I think this is important to talk about. Um, in general, especially flu season two, this would apply the same thing um, with the next slide. But stay home if you're sick, except to get medical care, to try to avoid uh, taxis, getting in cars people you don't know, you don't know what their risk profile or risk to you might be versus a family member where you know what they've been doing. I know this isn't always 100% possible, but just as possible. Uh, if you feel like you have symptoms of COVID, separate yourself from other people in your home to prevent the spread of them if possible. Um, there's no treatment for COVID, but you can seek medical care to relieve the symptoms. And if you're if you're ill, seek the help of your provider. Um, so the symptoms, just to review what they are. So there's a wide range. Um, and we, we're still learning about the long-term effects, but the onset initially can be mild or you know, asymptomatic to severe. And they may appear two to 14 days after exposure. People say fevers or chills, cough. Shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle aches, headaches, a new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting, diarrhea. Um, so these are updated by CDC all the time. They, it is not all inclusive. There are other things that people are seeing. Um, and you can see a lot of these are similar to what we see with the flu. So regardless if it's COVID or flu, if you're sick and you can manage at home, manage at home. If you feel like you need to see your provider, try to call ahead. Um, if you look at the next slide, just don't avoid, avoid medical care if you need that. That's, that's really important. We're seeing uh, before out of 10 U.S. adults avoid medical care because of concerns related to COVID-19. Um, and those are greater among people with two or more underlying conditions. So those comorbid conditions we're concerned about. Telehealth is an option. Um, there's a learning curve with that as well, but that's something it sounds like uh, volunteers could help you with, especially in your villages, who's getting you set up with that. Um, sorry, next slide, please. So again, what do you do if you get sick? Um, so you are sick at home, just have a plan. Think about this ahead of time. I think people are playing a little bit more with, this, with COVID. Um, but know how you can stay in touch with others by phone or email so that they can help you with what you need. Ask for help. There are a lot of people who are willing to help in this situation. Um, if you have a caregiver, determine who can help you if that caregiver gets sick uh, as a backup. Um, again, contact your healthcare provider. Maybe they can help you get extra medication to have at home so you don't have to go out to get it. Um, there are pharmacies that are also um, mailing it in. You can mail it to you. All right. Next slide, please. I'm, I think I'm out of my time, but I just want to go really quickly. So just again, plan ahead. Um, reach out to others so that you have a way to get the medication, food, uh, right to the physician or emergency department if you do get sick. Think about who those people might be. All right. And then there's quick ways. Do you want me to wrap up, Marty? Um, yeah, and we do have a couple of a uh, couple of a couple of questions that we would like to answer too. So, sure, if you can wrap up, we can provide the slides. Can we not? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. So, yeah, so just a, I was just going to say these are a couple of ways to um, make sure you do stay connected. We talked about some of them, those outdoor gatherings, but um, video calls, taking a virtual vacation with a friend on video, watch, watching a movie with video, planning a window visit. Um, if you're not quite ready to meet up with somebody outside can be 
great or everyone, you know, having a picnic in a park where you bring your own food. That's it. So just thinking about if you're looking for more information, CDC is excellent. There's always, it's updated very regularly, at least weekly on COVID. Um, and there is a specific section for COVID and the older population. Ira, there Thank are- Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. There are a couple of questions that we'd like to tackle if we may okay. real quick. Um, one, question, <laughs> one question is whether or whether flu ad or flu zone is stronger for post 65 year old individuals. Ooh. I'm not sure. Do you know that? Dr. Karakani? Yeah, so um, they, they're both very good for uh, people over 65. They work a little bit differently. Um, flu, flu ad is kind of, uh, it boosts the, your body's immune response to the vaccine. Um, and then the flu zone uh, has, uh, it's quadrivalent, so it has a little more, um, more antigen coverage. So they work very differently, but they both do the same exact thing. So um, I don't think there's been any studies to compare the two together to be able to recommend one versus the other. So as long as you get one of them, um, some places don't carry both. They have one or the other. So just get it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And the other question was about, um, you may have said that there were no known cases of transmission from touching items, but can you also talk about cleaning items regularly? Can you clarify? What is that? What do you mean by cleaning items regularly? Sure. So um, I would recommend as far as cleaning, so those high touch surfaces, I would try to clean with an EPA approved disinfectant. So making sure it can um, kill viruses and bacteria on a daily basis. Um, there's been, you know, there's back and forth at the beginning, people are wiping down groceries. Um, you can still do that. If you can set that stuff aside for a couple of days, it never hurts. Obviously, you can't, you know, something that needs to go in the freezer needs to go in the freezer or something that, you know, drink milk you want to drink today, just wipe it down. But you probably, it might be overkill. It's, I, um, I can just add a little something to that. So, I mean, yeah. I think it's going to be extremely hard to trace um, virus on an on a object. And so that's why I think it's a little hard to know how much is actually being spread that way as opposed to like from person to person. Um, right. So, but I do think, I mean, you know, yeah, if somebody like who has COVID sneezes in their hand and then opens a doorknob and then you go and you open that doorknob and you rub your eye, yeah, maybe that's a little bit worrisome, but do we need to freak out about the box of cereal at the store? Uh, maybe not as, as much as we thought, as long as we're practicing really good hand hygiene. I think the focus is yes. on hand hygiene. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Does Thank that you. answer the question? That I, person, I, I hope. I, I think so. Um, how cautious do I have to be about seeing my dentist? Hmm. Um, either, either you, Dr. Tarakani, or Myra. I need something fixed, but it's something I can live with. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. I. It's Dr. Tarkani. I um I brought my son to the dentist because they did it in a tent outside and they didn't do anything that was aerosolizing. I know different dentists have put things in the place with HEPA filtration, um, or scheduling, or um, doctors' offices will do this too. Stay in your car until we call you to come in. So there's you know shared no shared meeting room. Yeah. So it makes me a little nervous to be honest, but. You have to weigh the pros and the cons. Benefits versus the risk, too. Do you have a dental need that needs to take, be taken care of? And I think it really depends on the, the dentist's office and what sort of precautions they're taking. So I think right. it's really important to call them and find out what they are doing um, to help minimize risk and exposure. Um, I didn't need to get some dental work done. I did go to see my dentist, but you know they were keeping doors open. They had uh, air filtration systems. They had fan that was moving air throughout, um, you know, toward out towards the office. Everybody was wearing masks and face shields. So um, 
I felt pretty comfortable, but I think you really got to ask them what they're doing to protect you. Mm -hmm. Perfect question. Thank, thank you so much. That was a great question. Myra, we, we really appreciate you coming to talk to us today about prevention. I'm happy to. Thank you so much. And I'd like to now introduce Dr. Sarah Tar Tarakani, and she is uh, a Sibley Infectious Disease Specialist. She graduated from Ross University School of Medicine. Her residency was in internal medicine, and then she did an additional fellowship in infectious diseases at Drexel. She's board certified in both infect, um, internal medicine and infectious diseases, and she was at another Johns Hopkins Hospital before we happened to be privileged to have her at Sibley. Um, right in time for COVID to start. So welcome, Dr. Tarakani. We're glad you're here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you so much, Myra, because you actually covered a lot of important things. So it was a great oh. introduction to, to my uh, to what I'm going <laughs> to go over. Um, some of it may be a little uh, redundant now. Um, however, that's OK. The more you hear it, the more it'll stick. Um, all right, so next slide, please. Um, so some of the things I'm gonna go over today, just kind of a, a COVID update um, since the pandemic began. I'm gonna talk a little bit about testing because I know it's a little confusing for some. Who should be getting tested and why? Uh, when are you no longer considered contagious and can come out of isolation? Uh, what have we learned since the pandemic first started? What we, you know, what we've learned now that we didn't know months ago. Um, how much longer will this last? Because I know everybody wants to know that. Uh, currently available treatments, and then also, uh, and then we'll um, follow that up with vaccines. Next slide, please. Um, all right. So um, just a quick recap to kind of get a sense of where we are with things. So worldwide, there's 33 million cases, and we just surpassed a million deaths. In the USA, um, we're at a, a just over 7 million cases and over 205,000 deaths. Um, just to give some perspective, the US population is 330 million. So we're still nowhere near that. There's still a lot of people that are very susceptible to this. Um, and uh, this uh, shows how DC has been doing. And you know, you can see we peaked in May and we've come down since then and have kind of plateaued the past few months. Um, but certainly we could be doing better. Next slide. Um, Oops, sorry. That's okay. So I won't talk too much about this because fortunately Myra went over symptoms. The only things I will say, however, are um, that the so like she said flu season is upon us and um as a doctor i can tell you it's extremely difficult to tell the difference between flu and covid just based on symptoms all these symptoms overlap and so really without testing it's going to be very hard for us to know which one you have so we'll talk a little more about this also and um, myra already did as well but definitely get your flu vaccine because we kind of want to try to take that as out of the picture as much as possible. Next slide. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about testing and the different types. Um, so there's currently two different types of tests to diagnose an active infection. Uh, we have the most common test, which is in the left column, and that's the PCR or molecular method. This test is specifically looking for the virus's genetic material or RNA. This is a more complex test to do. It requires special machinery, um, somebody who's trained to do the test. So naturally, it's gonna have a longer turnaround time. This is typically hours, if you're lucky, or days, typically. Uh, however, it's, uh, for, so for those reasons, it is also the most expensive, but it's also highly accurate. Um, sometimes a little too accurate because it can still pick up dead virus particles, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, and the way that this test is done is through a nasal swab, a nose swab, a deep nose swab, um, the throat swab, or through saliva. 
And then the second type of test to look for uh, an active infection is an antigen test. And this works a little differently. It looks for specific proteins on the virus surface. Uh, this is a much less complex test. It doesn't require any special machinery or anything like that. It's very similar to like a rapid strep test or a rapid pregnancy test. So it's a lot cheaper. It can be done in you know most doctor's offices and the results come back a lot quicker in as early as 15 minutes. So uh, this test is really helpful from that standpoint that it's fast. However, um, all of those good things come at a cost because it's less reliable. It has a much higher rate of false negatives, which means that somebody who actually has the infection might test negative for it. Um, and in those situations, if we're still concerned, then we either need to repeat the test or we need to uh, do the other type, the molecular test, which is more accurate. Um, and this is also collected uh, similarly by a nasal swab, the deep nasal swab, uh, as well as a throat swab. And these tests you can, at this point, there's a lot of different places you can get this, at the hospital, doctor's office, urgent care, dedicated facilities. But the nice thing is that now they also have at-home testing kits available. You can buy it online. They mail it to you. You collect your own uh, nasal sample. You send it back, and you can get a result in a couple of days. Uh, it still requires a doctor's order, um, but that's convenient for people who don't want to go out. And then uh, recently also, we got a rapid uh, test, a rapid antigen test that was approved um, that I think a lot of doctor's offices will start using because that will give very quick uh, results uh, in like 15 minutes. So if you can imagine, that's going to be really great in trying to figure out who we need to isolate right away. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Next slide. Okay, and then the other test that we have um, is an antibody test. So this is really only a marker to look for a past infection. Uh, this cannot diagnose an active infection. And um, the way this works is that it looks for antibodies that your body would have produced after getting exposed to the virus. Uh, these antibodies, however, take several weeks to form. So uh, you typically need to wait at least a couple of weeks from the time you think you may have been exposed or got sick to do this test to figure out if you were exposed or not. And this is a blood test, so you do have to go to a lab and get it. And um, I know that LabCorp and Quest offer this test and you don't actually need a doctor's order. You can just pay for it online. Um, uh, I think you pay a fee for one of their doctors to order it and you can just go into a lab and get it. Uh, and then the only thing is, though, that um, we know that it can tell us if you've been exposed. We just don't exactly know what else the test means, whether, you know, it actually means that you're going to be immune for a long time, and if so, for how long. So there's some unanswered questions, but we'll talk more about that, too. <laughs> Next slide. So who should get tested? Um, basically, anyone who has symptoms can and should get tested. Uh, at this point, there's a very low threshold for testing. Um, if it can be helpful uh, for a lot of reasons to go and get a test, especially if you live with someone or someone who's at an increased risk for having a severe infection. And it's also very helpful just from a public health standpoint, so we can get a sense of, you know, how many people out there are infected, what is, you know, the mortality of this, who's getting really sick from this. Um, so it can be helpful. And then uh, also, if you've been in close contact for at least 15 minutes with somebody who has a documented COVID infection, then you should also go and get tested, whether you have symptoms or not. And again, that's just so we can find out, you know, do you have the infection? Do you need to stay home? And, you know, that way stop the transmission to others. Uh, and then asymptomatic testing. Um, Anybody who lives in a high transmission zone, who's been in like congregate settings around a lot of other people, uh, if the health department calls you and tells you to get tested because you may have been exposed or if your employer requires it. 
Um, but there's just only a few uh, situations where you might need that. Next slide. Um, so just a, a quick uh, a word on treatments. So unfortunately, there are still no FDA approved treatments. Um, there's still no treatments for patients who are not in the hospital. And there are still no drugs uh, recommended or approved for prophylaxis or prevention. Um, so <laughs> these are areas where, uh, you know, it would be really helpful um, to be able to have a drug, at least for patients who get it on the outpatient. But fortunately, a lot of studies are being done. So um, hopefully we'll get something. And the only treatments that we do have are for patients who are hospitalized with COVID and who are generally requiring, are sick enough that they're requiring oxygen. Um, none of these are FDA approved, but they are available under emergency use authorization. And uh, anyway, so that's all I'll say about that. Next slide. Okay, and then when are you no longer contagious and can come out of isolation? So for most people, this is gonna mean about 10 days after your symptoms first appeared and about 24 hours after you no longer have fever without the help of like Tylenol or Advil or things like that. Um, and that your symptoms are generally improving. So most people have, don't need a follow-up test. Like I said before, the test is very sensitive. And so we've learned that, uh, you know, people who are feeling better, were still testing positive. We didn't really know if, you know, that meant they're contagious or not. Um, but that's just because the test can pick up even dead virus particles. So it's a, it's a little too good of a test. Uh, there are people, whoever, however, who may need to isolate longer so people who get really sick from the infection, who are hospitalized, or who have a weakened immune system, they may be shedding the virus for a longer period of time. And so they may need to be isolating for a longer period of time. And these people might um, benefit from having a repeat testing done to be able to see if they can uh, come out of isolation. But those people should really check with their doctor. Next slide. Okay. So I really like this, um, this picture because uh, it kind of gives us a good idea of what happens when people sneeze. So let's assume this person has COVID and has just sneezed. So as you can see, right after the sneeze, this very concentrated um, cloud of virus is expelled. And you know the force carries it forward the heavier particles, which we call droplets, they tend to, they're heavy, so they fall to the ground and um, typically within six feet, which is why, where that rule comes from. But then there's these smaller particles or aerosols that can kind of float around in the air longer. And these are the ones that, that we're kind of worried about and we have learned that they can also spread the infection. So. This is where masks are gonna be really effective and will come into play. And I'll talk about that in a second. But remember this picture. <laughs> okay, um, so what have we learned uh, in regards to transmission since the pandemic first started? Well, we've learned, like I just said, that aerosol or air transmission is possible. So if you're wearing a mask, you can really reduce the amount of aerosol and droplets that are getting out there. Loud talking, like Myra said, loud talking, heavy breathing, singing, screaming, these tend to expel more virus. And so that's why, you know, nightclubs and gyms are still uh, considered risky places. Um, and like Myra talked about, you know, germs on surfaces. So we've learned that this probably is not a uh, major route for transmission. Um, just because, you know, that we, there's virus, there's some virus on a surface we don't know necessarily how strong or how capable it still is of transmitting an infection to somebody who touches it. So until we know a little bit more, I mean, we're still recommending cleaning, but again, I don't think we need to be scared of the cereal box per se. Just wash your hands. Um, 
And then we've also learned that children can get sick and, and can spread the virus, which we didn't know a whole lot about early on in the uh, pandemic. Um, they don't tend to get as sick, although some do, uh, but they can still uh, spread it. And we've also learned that the warm weather hasn't really affected things. So uh, it's still continued to spread despite uh, the summer. Next slide. Um, Dr. Tarakani, somebody has raised their hand and I just want to quickly tell everybody that um, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen because we, um, you, you don't have any ability to be heard. So please uh, type it in. Thanks so much. Oops. Okay, uh, and then a little more on what we've learned about transmission. So Myra covered this as well, um, but the one of the things we've seen, the trend we've seen, is that majority of transmissions occur within households. So a family member gets it and brings it home and ends up infecting the other family members. And uh, again, that's because of these four major factors, which are crowded situations, close physical contact, enclosed spaces, and a uh, increased uh, exposure, duration of exposure to the virus. So uh, that's where I, early testing will be important so people can know if they should isolate, um, but also other things that can be done, at least while the weather is still warm is good ventilation indoors. Um, so, and this is like for places like, you know, gyms and the dentists and yoga studios, things like that. Uh, you know, making sure that you're constantly moving air so that cloud of virus isn't just lingering in the air. Um, having fans on, windows open, air purifiers, things like that. Uh, they also surveyed um, individuals who were infected and found that 40% of them had dined, uh, dined at a restaurant prior to their infection. So that's a pretty high number, and it's a little scary for me. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we need to think about those things um, and just take some more precautions if we want to venture out there or just pick up food. Next slide. Okay. So a big thing that I know um, Myra touched on is masks, masks, masks. Um, but we've really learned that they truly are effective. Um, and they're effective for a number of reasons. So we know that what they can do is for people who are infected and sick is that they can reduce the amount of virus that is being expelled. So let's think about that picture I showed you with the, the uh, virus cloud that they're putting out there. If people are wearing a mask and they cough or sneeze into it, which is unpleasant, but nonetheless, um, they're preventing that cloud formation from getting out. And whatever does get out, it's going to be much fewer particles and it's hopefully not going to travel as far. So that in itself is going to be really helpful in uh, decreasing the transmission. The other thing that we've learned um, is that a higher inoculum or a higher, higher viral load uh, and a longer duration of exposure can increase your chance of infection, but also increase the severity. So this is kind of a big deal because, so what we're basically saying is that if you're exposed to maybe a, just a little bit of virus, um, you could potentially still get sick, but you probably are not going to get as sick. Um, or not have as many symptoms. And uh, we think we hold this to be true because they, there was a, a U.S. Navy ship, the um, Theodore Roosevelt, that had about 5,000 crew members. 1,300 of them were infected, and they ended up surveying 400 of, uh, of the people, of the sailors. And what they found is that the ones that were consistently wearing their masks were much less likely to get infected, but also had much milder symptoms. Um, so that's really, you know, that's really good evidence to show that it can really help, uh, uh, help decrease the amount of spread. And then the other thing that we've learned is that asymptomatic people 
can still spread the disease. So if people say, well, you know, I'm not having symptoms, why should I wear a mask? Well, this is exactly why, because people may not know that they have the infection and they could still be spreading it. So uh, it, again, all the more reason to wear it. Um, and I just wanna give a couple other examples of uh, some cases where uh, wearing masks has been very helpful. There was a hairdresser in Missouri who uh, had, who tested positive for COVID. However, she was wearing a mask. And when they tested 140 of her clients who she had had during that time, they all tested negative. There was a man who flew on a 15 hour flight and he was coughing the whole time. However, he was wearing a mask and when they tested everybody around him, they all tested negative. So these are all really uh, uh, helpful things um, in support of wearing masks. Um, next slide. Okay. Um, what have we learned about immunity? So this is a very gray area that we still don't know a whole lot about and we're still trying to learn. Part of this is that not enough time has passed. You know, we've really only been dealing with this uh, virus for less than a year. So it's just not enough time for us to know and be able to follow people who've had uh, the infection and see, you know, how long did the antibodies last for? Did it protect them from getting sick or getting reinfected? Um, so some of these things we just don't know. The assumption is that it probably gives you protection for at least a few months um, based on what we currently know. And we think that generally the more severe the infection is, the more antibodies your body will produce that will hopefully help give you protection. Um, so perhaps milder infections may not give you the same amount of protection, but I think we still need a little more information on whether, you know, can people get infected if they encounter a different strain? Um, will it be milder the second time around? So there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Next slide. Okay, and then what have we learned about risk factors? Um, so even early on, we knew that certain people uh, were getting sicker, like older age, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes. But the other piece of information we've gained is the racial disparity with which this virus affects our population. And we've seen, as you can see from this table from the CDC, that Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans are much more likely to be infected, much more likely to be hospitalized, and much more likely to die from this virus. And there's a few reasons why we think that that is. So socioeconomic status could have something to do with it. Poor access or lack of access to healthcare. Uh, they tend to have jobs where uh, in critical infrastructure where they may be exposed to more people with uh, infection. And they also tend to live in multi-generational homes where grandparents, parents, and grandchildren are all under the same roof. And so, like we said, that's a huge uh, uh, way in, this, in which this virus spreads. Next slide. When will it end? <laughs> so I'm sure everybody wants to know this. Um, but unfortunately, I'm not sure that anyone really knows or has a good answer. Um, I do agree that the virus is probably here to stay for a while. Uh, I think the more we learn about our body's immune response to this virus, the closer we will be to that answer. Um, the longer our, our body uh, has, uh, develops immunity to the infection, um, the more likely, the, or the faster this infect, faster the pandemic will end. Um, however, again, we still need to learn some things. And then also depends on how soon we have a safe, effective vaccine, because that will really be a game changer. Um, we've all heard the different scenarios of, you know, should we allow the virus to spread naturally and allow uh, us to reach herd immunity faster, which is when at least 70% of the population has been infected. But um, I don't think that's a good strategy because that's going to mean that millions of people will need to get the infection and millions will also die. And I think our healthcare system will be devastated um, in those situations. So I think we're going to have to continue with what we're doing, which is 
until we have a good vaccine, which is masking, social distancing, and all of these things, and keep putting out the fires as they come. Next slide. Okay, now vaccines. Um, so we all know about Operation Warp Speed, which is the White House's initiative to get a, a vaccine out as soon as possible for the general public. Um, we currently have 42 vaccines in clinical trials, which is pretty revolutionary because uh, no vaccine has ever been made this quickly. Um, 11 of them are in phase three trials. And phase three is when scientists give the vaccine to thousands of people and uh, wait to see um, how many become infected compared to the volunteers who got placebo. Uh, the FDA has already said that in order for this vaccine to be considered effective, it would have to protect at least 50% of the people who are vaccinated for it. So that's what we're gonna be looking for on, um, waiting on you know, when we get some of this data from the, the vaccine trials. Next slide. Um, the, uh, so all of these companies currently have uh, vaccines in the phase three trials. Um, our, the US government has poured billions of dollars into vaccine research and manufacturing so that we can hopefully get something out soon. Um, when will it happen? Uh, to be honest, I think that 2020 is very ambitious. Um, I think that we just haven't had enough time for the trials to be able to see, get the data that we need um, regarding its efficacy and safety. So uh, I think what's more, more uh, of a possibility is that we'll see something sometime in 2021 um, and I think that's, again, a little, a lot more realistic. Um, however, the good news is that, you know, we don't have to wait for approval for the companies to start manufacturing. There's something called at-risk production, which means that a lot of these companies are already producing these vaccines. So once they get the go, if, you know, if it is safe and effective, they can start distributing. If it doesn't, obviously they have to toss it, but but that's a, uh, something that will be good for getting this faster. Next slide. And then who will get the vaccine? So there will definitely be um, a priority list in the order that we're gonna give it. Uh, this is just a sample draft um, that's been proposed. So in the first phase, it'll be uh, high risk workers, like healthcare workers, first responders, and then people who have risk factors for severe disease, as well as uh, elderly living in nursing facilities. Um, and then other critical infrastructure workers will be in the next phase along with teachers and prisons and such. And then it'll go on to like younger people, healthy people. Next. Um, and I know that vaccine safety is on everybody's mind right now, especially considering how quickly things are moving along. Um, I just want to say that, you know, the FDA has a very rigorous process for, uh, for what it involves to pass a vaccine or to approve a vaccine. It has to go through the, the, manuf the vaccine companies really have to show that it's safe and effective. Then the FDA approves it. Then it goes to another board who reviews it. Um, so there's multiple steps involved. I think that if the data uh, shows that you know there's efficacy there and there's safety and it goes through this process, I would feel safe and comfortable taking that vaccine. Obviously, if uh, the data is not good and it's still trying to get pushed through, I would be <laughs> worried and hesitant. So I think we really need to see what, what the data shows and what the scientists are saying. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Next slide. Ah, uh, I can't hear you. I am so sorry. I was on mute. I just want to be uh, to honor your time, and I noticed that it is after five. If you can stay a little bit longer, we're happy for you to to finish. But I just want to yeah. honor your time. <laughs> sorry, I went over. We, we do have a lot of questions. Um, but I, if, if folks uh, want to stay, we'd, we'd be happy to move, uh, keep going a little bit longer. Yes, 
I'm happy to stay. <laughs> um, and uh, just to touch on this one more time and kind of really um, uh, hammer this in. So it's this season especially, it's gonna be extremely important to get the flu shot because right now we're facing a double threat. We have both COVID uh, that's looming and then flu season is coming. And we know from last season that people can get both. And if you get one, it could you would potentially be more susceptible to the other because your body's already going to be weak. And, um, and it's, there's a chance that it's really going to overwhelm our healthcare system or we're, if we're trying to deal with, uh, you know, really sick COVID patients and really sick uh, flu patients. So if we can try to get, take flu out of the picture as much as we can, it will be really, really helpful for everybody. So this is a great time to get your flu shot if you haven't already. Um, I'll uh, leave it there. Next slide. And then lastly, what can you do? Uh, I love Myra's presentation because she went over a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff that we can all do uh, to help uh, prevent the spread and just how to deal and cope with this and keep living our lives. Um, but really in order for us to beat this thing and kind of try to return to any sort of normal life again, um, everybody has to play their part. So we all have to be involved. Um, and the things that we can do, uh, minimize our interactions with people outside of the home, not congregate, watch our distance, wear a mask, wash our hands constantly, get your flu shot. And lastly, um, just be patient. We're all going through this together. We're all learning about this together. Um, so I think it's just really important that we all be good neighbors for each other. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you so much. We so appreciate you, you and Myra both being here today. There are quite a few questions. So um, we'll just start at the top. What's the difference between the older antigen test 15 minutes and the new antigen test 15 minutes? Um, so I'm not sure that I know because most of the tests that have uh, been done up until now are mostly um, PCR tests. Um, and I'm not aware of a older antigen versus a newer antigen. So I'm not sure, maybe you can clarify your <laughs> question. Um, can a person contract COVID by touching an infected surface with a cut on their hand? Uh, no, so the main way that this virus is transmitted is through uh, the uh, oral, nasal, and eye passages or eye mucosa. So you would have to, so the cut itself is not an issue so much as you actually touching that surface and then rubbing your eye or sticking your finger in your mouth. Thank you so much. Any idea why virus is resurging in places like New York? Um, well, there's probably a lot of a lot of different things that could be contributing. Um, I think that you know perhaps uh, we've maybe gotten a little bit lax with um, some of our practices, and as things open up, you know people tend to feel safer and they think, oh, everything's probably okay, and try to go about their life as usual. Um, but I mean, I think, you know, this virus is still out there. It's just a matter of what we're doing to keep it under control. So I think it's probably just that we may have become a little lax. Thank you. Any idea? I'm sorry, if I'm outside wearing a mask, but someone else isn't, what's my risk? So many people on the sidewalk, sidewalk don't wear masks. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I mean, you, we know that masks can also be um, helpful for the people wearing them just because it's decreasing the amount that you're actually taking in, the amount of virus. Um, as far as, you know, a momentary passing someone on the sidewalk, I don't think that's as much of a, a, a concern because, again, when we talk about that concentrated COVID cloud, um, you know, if air is, if you're outside and air is moving it and you're, you know, moving and you're not standing in the same spot in that cloud, um, it's not going to be as much of a risk of exposure. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you so much. Um, is food delivery safe? 
<laughs> um, so I don't know, Myra can <laughs> probably talk a little bit more about that because she went over a lot of uh, those things. But um, again, I think th from my standpoint, I think that, you know, as long as you're uh, touching your, I mean, you're washing your hands, um, it's going to be, I mean, I think nowadays most restaurants are being very good about having all their food preparers wear masks and gloves. So probably not as much of an issue. I don't know if uh, Myra has anything to add. I think, I mean, agree. Just um, if you can take a peek inside the restaurant and see what they're doing. Um, I've observed, you know, good and bad. So, um, but again, you can, when you come in, after you handle any of the parts, just make sure you wash your hands before you eat and then you dispose of, I, I always throw away the bag at the containers pretty soon after, but I, we, I get take out. Thank you so much. So this next question for someone who is interested in beginning an intimate relationship with someone, should a negative COVID test make it safe? <laughs> um, so that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I think, um, it's hard to say because, you know, it's really, the tests are only good for like one moment in time. And just because you're negative today doesn't mean that you'll still be negative tomorrow or three days from now. So I think it probably comes down more to, you know, how safe is this person with their, um, you know, the measures that they're taking? Are they you know, avoiding crowds? Are they good about hand hygiene and wearing a mask? And so I think those should be the focus of the questions and not so much the test. Um, you know, what sort of practices are they doing to minimize their risk? And, you know, do they have any symptoms? What percentage of asymptomatic individuals remain so and never become ill? Um, so, of people who have tested positive, um, they think that potentially up to 40% um, are asymptomatic. Um, I don't know if that's what you meant or if you meant anything more than that, but yeah, I mean, so we don't know if, you know, are these people in the range of like pre-symptomatic, meaning they haven't developed symptoms yet, or, you know, are they just going to be asymptomatic the whole time? Um, but the estimate is that up to 40% of people fall into that category of pre-symptomatic or completely asymptomatic. Thank you. Is a risk factor for underlying conditions any different for type 1 versus type 2 diabetes? And does well-controlled diabetes lower the risk and or severity if contracted? Or is that not really known at this point in time? Um, I think that the, the risk of between type 1 and 2 is probably going to be the same. Um, it, in general with diabetes and any type of infection, the better controlled it is, the, uh, the lower that risk is. Um, there's some degree of probably underlying issue that you know, may still make them a little more susceptible, but I think you know, the better control you have, uh, the less risk you have. Thank you so much. Um, so the, the person that asked about the antigen test um, did post something again. Um, she said, you referred to a new antigen test, I thought, with faster turnaround. Okay. So what's, what's the difference Oh, um, between that and the sorry, I don't know if I meant to say, um, I just meant to say the, the, the older antigen tests were typically taking like up to an hour, and a newer test has come out that is 15 minutes. Okay. That's Thank you I mean. so much. Uh, the hair salon. What about going to the hair salon? Um, yeah, so uh, I think that, you know, these things get a little bit tricky. Um, I think it's going to be really important, again, just to make sure that the, the, that um, salon, you know, everybody in there is very good about making, is wearing masks, that they're all requiring people to wear masks and that they've, you know, lower the number of clients that they're actually allowing inside of their um, studio and, you know, hopefully taking some measures to keep air moving inside of the salon. So I think, again, it's going to be really important to ask them what they're doing to help uh, decrease the risk. That's a great answer and a great question. Thanks so much. And then 
um, someone said, is it okay to go into someone's home or not? Like inside the home. Yeah, uh, so it certainly, it can be risky, like we said, um, because we know that being indoors is generally going to increase your risk. Um, you know, I guess I would see, you know, how urgently do you need to go inside their home? Is it possible to meet outside of the home? If you are inside, um, keep your distance, everybody wear a mask, and perhaps, you know, if you can keep like a, a window or door open and fans on to perhaps uh, keep air moving. So, um, you know, the air, the same air is not staying stagnant inside. Thanks. Um, and then um, one last question, is obesity itself a risk factor or is it that obese folks usually have the other underlying conditions? Both. Um, so obesity in itself is a risk factor, uh, but also, yeah, ob obese patients tend to have, you know, high blood pressure and diabetes and things like that. So, um, but yes, even by itself, it's a risk factor. We've, we've learned. Okay. Thank you both uh, for being here today, Dr. Tarakani and Myra Seisel. We are so grateful for you being here. And I'd like to also point out that this uh, session has been, this webinar has been recorded and it will be available on the websites for Palisades Village, Cleveland and Woodley Park Village and Northwest Neighbors Village, as well as the Sibling Memorial Community Health websites. So you will be able to, it, it'll take a little bit of time, but you will be able to uh, listen to it up close and personal again. Again, so much we thank you, uh, Dr. Tarakani and Myra, and as well as uh, Stephanie Chong and Frank Fenneman and Andrea Sakosha for your work in putting all this together. Thank you so much. Um, and we also wanna honor the District of Columbia for the Community Hope Grant that allowed this to take place. Thanks so much. Be well and have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you.